Please, come in. Welcome to my apartment. I trust you'll find my voice is more palatable against this decor. I continue to be an excellent host. I'm expecting two more guests later. First one, and then another. Make yourself comfortable in the meantime, but don't touch the candy on the table. That is reserved for one of my guests. Let's have a look at this disc. Oh my, she really did a number on it, didn't she? It's virtually unplayable like this. What a shame. There are many moments trapped on this disc which you would have no doubt found to be quite exhilarating. But yes, I can fix it. It will take time, though. I estimate, by which I mean I am certain by way of omniscience, that when I am done we will have reached just shy of the green circle on the card above. I am sure you have already presumed this mark represents the beginning of Act 6. The disc should be ready to run in time to witness the critical event, a confluence of thickly interwoven, a-concurrent circumstances which have been meticulously arranged by myself, influenced to a much lesser extent by you, and by an even more negligible degree, our heroes. The Scratch will be healed in time to watch these heroes put into motion, yes, the Scratch itself. If you don't mind waiting here while I complete my repairs, I will tell the rest of the story. I will show you as well, as I recover data from the disc. But the visuals I supply will be nothing more than abbreviated snapshots, and my telling will be abridged. Immortality notwithstanding, I'm not going to live forever, you know. And since for once in my life time is at a premium, let's get on with it. Where were we? Never mind. I figured it out instantly because of my unfathomable intellect, limitless knowledge, and mind-boggling charisma. Granted, my charisma had less to do with it than the other qualities, but it didn't hurt, did it? Here, I'll show you. The Seer of Mind had challenged the Thief of Light to a simple game of chance. If the result was the undamaged side, the thief would agree to stay. If not, she would go. The result of the flip was left inconclusive, at which point you decided to pay me a visit. But the inconclusive should not be confused with the uncertain. The actual result was trivial. It was a constant across all timelines. Both the seer and the thief knew this. The thief used her abilities to steal the fortune of her opponent and forced the flip to yield what she regarded as the most favorable outcome. The seer anticipated this move correctly. This is why I don't care much for gambling. While a sucker is born with each tick of the clock, a cheater is born with each talk betwixt. Also, because it is boring, and I'm already a very wealthy man. The seer relayed her terms through the generally understood argo of an assassin. The result, go, while at face value would suggest the thief was allowed to leave, was actually the seer's code word for the threat of death. This was obvious to everyone, including the thief. While the thief turned to fly away, making a show of claiming her prize, the seer would stab her in the back the moment her guard was dropped. This was her plan. Not a particularly clever tactic in its own right, but its ingenuity didn't dwell in the novelty of the ruse, nor even the neutralized probabilities in the game of chance. Psychology was in play. Naturally, the thief knew this was her intent all along. She knew the seer would have understood the outcome to be rigged, and that she likely intended to kill her as a consequence of the fixed result. This was to be seen as an implicit dare to the thief to allow the flip to fall fairly, something which the seer knew the thief's ego wouldn't allow. And the seer knew the thief knew all this as well. 
Just another pair of cheaters attempting to play with their cards face up. Amateurs. Each was gambling not with any vehicle of probability, which had been eliminated from the equation, but with each other's intentions. The thief indeed took the seer's bait, stealing the luck needed to affect the flip in defiance of her dare, and in turning to leave, she then posed a dare of her own to the seer, challenging her to back up the implied threat. This was the thief's gamble. She wagered the seer would not be able to go through with it. It turned out she was right. So ends a tale of rivalry. Well, almost. There's a bit more. But in order to understand its proper conclusion, we should first catch up with another of my protégés, from whom I'm expecting a message shortly. The other seer. The other hero of light. Round two. Strike. Here we left our human hero of light. She flew away to take vengeance on the noir this side of the scratch. That is, the one less angry and dangerous. The one not yet unmotivated by a compelling duel. Compelling, but not particularly challenging. The seer wouldn't win this duel. My apologies if this spoils the outcome for you. I can't speak as discreetly about such matters against this canvas. I warned her. I warned my neophyte protege not to stare into that ball. I told her about stairs. <laughs> Moving on. I'll remind you that the pacing of my account will be characterized by a reduction in granularity from what you have come to expect by way of an undamaged disc. You will imagine the remainder of the duel to be sensational, and I will continue my steady distribution of the facts as if they were pieces of candy poured from a bottomless white hemisphere. The duel ends. The seer dies. The Slayer departs. The air comes back to life. This outcome was hardly a point of suspense. It would be disingenuous of me to present it as such, and I will not belittle your intelligence with such a tawdry narrative ploy. It would be rude, and I am too well-dressed for that kind of behavior. If there truly stood some chance of permanence to the air's corpsehood, I can hear you asking now, how could this moment later come to pass? And for that matter, what sort of story would this be with our human hero of breath made to stay a cadaver? Definitely not one the Alpha timeline would allow. And what sort of spectator would you be if you'd forgotten the terms ruling the conditional immortality he won with his previous, similarly unceremonious impaling. He'd done nothing to earn martyrdom, by which we might laud his fall is heroic. Nor had he tasted notoriety. To secure a death one may pass just. And while I can't give you my assurance, I'm reasonably convinced of this much. When the hero of breath dies for good, it won't be as a scoundrel. But not for lack of a devoted mentor. If I had served as his mentor directly, rather than as his mentor's mentor's mentor, he may have stood a fair chance of perpetrating something underhanded. At the very least, his jokes might have been better. Instead, he got her, the other hero of light. Always bugging him. Bugging and fussing and meddling. What's her deal? Let's find out. I mentioned there was a bit more to her story. I believe it's time to resume it. 
I trust you won't mind if I step away for a moment. I have important guests arriving very soon. If you need me, I'll be up here making sure everything is in order, which it already is, and keeping an eye, which I don't have, on the clock, which I don't need. Apologies for my preoccupation. I have managed to pacify the rowdier of my two other guests with sugary little black dogs, so that I may continue my narration, but only briefly. In a moment, I will go stand over by my typewriter and teach my neophyte protege the consequences for taking advice from a strange man over the internet, while I continue to attend to my second guest, who is you from an earlier point in the story. Remember, we met here in my apartment a little while ago. At the moment, I was busy hosting you from the future, who is you right now, but I did not mention this at the time. I would have introduced your past self to your future self and vice versa, but it is a well-known fact that past and future selves tend not to get along. A good host would never tolerate the potential for discord among guests, and as hosts go, I am simply the best there is. Please don't be alarmed. Past you was just leaving. Where was I? Of course. The two heroes of light had challenged the same Jack Noir, the one straddling the scratch and about 20 hours of his own time to a circumstantially simultaneous pair of duels. Circumstantial simultaneity is a concept more complex than its temporal analog, and is valuable for examining the properties of paradox space. It is the agent responsible for the major cosmic event which pre-extinction Alternians came to refer to as the Great Undoing. The same concept rules the innumerable lesser events by which this critical moment shall be catalyzed, including the break my employer's arrival, the detonation of a very powerful bomb, and my own death. It is an abstraction weaving together the fortunes of otherwise perfectly disparate chronologies, such as those bound to a pair of distinct sessions. It's not fully comprehensible to a mortal mind, and the length I will go to explain it to you will not extend beyond this sentence. But the story will. The Slayer was, for the moment, unmotivated by the thief's motion for a compelling duel. This side of the scratch, he opted for a more ruthless and calculating policy of extermination. On his arrival, not about to repeat the mistakes leading to his banishment, he quickly obliterated all twelve planets, followed by Prospet and Durst, to weed out those who might outsmart him in the same manner. With as little fanfare, he seized the opportunity to follow the thief's trail quickly before it dissipated, and destroyed their hideout in the Vale. And now knowing her position, he would soon return for the duel she wanted. 
but not without a pair of trophies. <laughs> <laughs>